Hello and welcome to Wednesday Warfare, where I review NXT and AEW Dynamite back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. Well, Dynamite has a tall order ahead of itself, trying to follow up on the success of Double or Nothing. Meanwhile, NXT had a lot of momentum in the last couple of weeks, building up to this particular episode. So, which show shakes out? We're going to find out in a little bit. But first, as always, like what you like, don't be a dick. NXT opens up with a triple threat match in the Interim Cruiserweight Championship Group A Tournament Finals. You've got Kushida, Drake Maverick, and Jake Atlas. All three of these guys had a true tie after three matches, so this uh, is the tiebreaker, the triple threat match here. Action is fast and fierce from the get-go. Kushida, my favorite spot in this matchup here, is Kushida Germans Drake uh, Drake Maverick while he's pinning Jake Atlas, and he gets uh, you know kicked out and everything, but it's just a really cool move before the commercial break. Atlas hits the rainbow DDT onto Drake, but the pin's broken up. The match ends when Kushida's got Jake Atlas, jumps off the uh, top rope with him in the cross arm breaker, and when they're in the hold, Drake actually covers Jake for the pinfall and the three count, so Drake Maverick defies the odds, wins yet again, and is going to be facing El Eo Del Fantasma at In Your House for that interim cruiserweight championship. Uh, they also set up the fact that uh, during that pinfall, just before the three count, you see Atlas tapping out, so there is some controversy there, but later on we see a post-match promo with Atlas, Kushida comes in there and says, you just should win. You you, you go win uh, against Phantasma. And then Drake, a bit of sportsmanship here, telling uh, Kushida that when he wins the championship that he wants Kushida to have the first shot at that. Uh, what a story it's been for Drake Maverick uh, these last several weeks. From being announced as one of the many who were released several uh, weeks ago to this run being extended by being part of the interim tournament. I mean, maybe we will see Drake get rehired. It's possible. I mean, we heard that Drew Gulak, apparently his contract has been renewed and renegotiated, so he's not gone after all, so he's back apparently. Uh, so anything's possible, and you know, I'm excited for the blow-off in that title match either way. The Garganos make their way to the ring, and uh, like they did on Monday, by the way, this week's NXT is the first in a while where we see some people in the audience. Uh, the NXT and Performance Center wrestlers sitting up standing in the uh, crowd all night. So it's, it's, it's refreshing to once again hear promos where the wrestlers are actually interacting and feeding off the energy from the fans at ringside. Uh, Johnny says he wants to give the men of NXT a chance, just like he got a chance years ago. So he's holding the Johnny Gargano Invitational, draws like a name, and it's uh, Evolve wrestler Adrian Alanis. And uh, the match is very quick. It's a squash. Johnny with the cheap shot out of the handshake gets him in the Gargano Escape to win the match pretty handily. But then after uh, the match is over and he and Candice LeRae are celebrating, we then see Mia Yim and Keith Lee doing a parody of the Dinner with a Gargano segment. They're in their apartment and they're they're doing the whole kind of same kind of shtick, and uh, it's very tongue-in-cheek, very fourth wall breaking, where Mia has this flashlight, and we hear this uh, even goofier sound effect as things go black and white, and she's kind of doing the whole thing where she's so, so she's talking trash about Cancel Ray and everything, and Keith Lee's going, what are you doing? What is this about? He doesn't like the flashlight in his face, but I love Keith Lee here, because it's the burn of the millennium here, where he says to Gargano, he's like, I'm, it's like, I'm Johnny Gargano, and one thing that me and my action figure have in common is we're the same size. That was just a hilarious line. Then Tegan Knox just walks in unannounced, but she's got the food for dinner. It's a pizza that she ate most of for whatever reason. And uh, then the segment ends with Mia and uh, Keith getting some parting shots, some last words in on the Garganos and everything. You know, I just love this segment. The Gargano uh, dinner segments we saw in the last couple of weeks, like I thought that they were okay, but at times a little silly. So I think that the fact they kind of reference that and just kind of like turn it on its ear in this period, I thought it was fun. This the, the Mia and Keith have this just relaxed chemistry, and I think it really works when they're doing uh, this segment here. I, I'm enjoying the buildup here between the Organos and Keith and Mia. We get a promo from the new NXT Tag Team Champions, Imperium. They say they're the new champs. They're not dropping the belt anytime soon. By the way, Walter, still the NXT UK Champion. And then they have some strong words for Oni Lorcan and Danny Burch, saying when they mocked their pose last week, they were a disgrace to the canvas that they work on. And so then, later in the show, we actually see see a uh, different promo of Lorcan and Burge, and I liked what they did with that too because you get kind of a refresher of like who they are and like why they're a team because they haven't been on NXT TV that much lately, so kind of a refresher course if you're unfamiliar or you're kind of like lost in the shuffle with uh, Lorcan and Burge, and so they meet in a bar, do they, and they talk about Imperium, and they basically say we're going to gun for those tag titles. I mean... They made it pretty obvious last week, and then the promo that Imperium had early in the night, you know, kind of gave that away. But, uh, yeah, I think that the build has been kind of subtle for this one, and just right away, it just 
sets uh, Lorcan and Birch up as kind of like legitimate contenders showing what those guys can do in the ring. Shotzi Blackheart taking on Raquel Gonzalez up next, looking for some revenge after the tag team match they had saw Dakota and Raquel uh, win that one. Uh, Dakota Kai at one point in the match hijacks Shotzi's little tank at ringside. Then Tegan Knox uh, returns, second time we've seen her on the night. She evens the odds before we go to break. Some good work here. I love Shotzi's counters near the end here, but at one point she does this big uh, trust fall from like the uh, the top rope to the outside and she lands super high on like the back of her the upper back back of her head it looked really sick for that, that bump to happen there and luckily she was able to, to continue, continue with the matchup uh, in the end Candice LeRae shows up and gets in Tegan Knox's face and while that's going on the referee is distracted Dakota Kai helps Raquel win the match uh, I think this is some good stuff I mean the action and just the the tension of oh my god Shasi almost landed on her head doing that thing I think certainly elevated the uh, urgency of the match but I think yeah the action itself was good and uh, kind of disappointed that after that really cool promo that Shotzi had last week that she ends up losing in this encounter but uh, you know it, it, she'll get those wins back later eventually probably. Speaking of the ladies you have a tag team match up next you've got uh, Charlotte Flair's opponents for takeover Io Shirai and Rhea Ripley taking on Charlotte and a mystery partner but because Charlotte's rubbed so many ladies the wrong way since becoming the champion who would actually be her partner it's Chelsea Green who's accompanied by Robert Stone of the Robert Stone brand. Uh, as the match goes on, Chelsea and EO trading some dives to the outside. Uh, Charlotte at one point tries to go to chop EO in the corner, and the third time she does it, she misses and she hits her own partner by mistake. Uh, EO and Ray look great in the hot tag, but then Chelsea takes a bullet uh, for her tag team partner. She gets laid out, and then uh, Rhea Ripley's knocked off the apron. Charlotte uh, rolls up EO and gets her feet on the ropes to win dirty, and so looking good for the champion here, but uh, that was an okay match. Great exposure for Chelsea here because she's instantly made legitimate by not only teaming up with Charlotte but also going against the top two contenders and right now she's been kind of like on the outside of that whole scene so being put in a match like this I think does a great job to give like I said gives her credibility gives her legitimacy and who knows maybe after this program with EO and, R and Rhea dies down maybe Chelsea's kind of the next woman in uh, once a babyface wins the championship. Fallout from the dinner parody the Organos are hopping mad over what they saw earlier and they're also mad at uh, Sarah Schreiber for saying that the segment was entertaining. They took great offense to that. Johnny says he will take Keith Lee's North American Championship at TakeOver, and then meanwhile, Candace challenges Mia to a match for next week on television. And by the way, Tegan Knox, you should be ashamed of yourself. It's time for another Zoom chat on NXT as Adam Cole has contract negotiations with GM William Regal. Cole demands the Undisputed Era get a fair shot at the tag team titles. He also demands that Velveteen Dream be out of NXT and his life. Uh, Regal says that he might be giving Dream a chance at the championship once again at TakeOver. Like, might? Anyway, uh, Cole acts very self-assured of himself, but Regal tells him not to act like a bay bay. Oh, snap. But then Cole just counters that by saying, oh, that's the best joke you've had since you were a man's man. Oh, shit! They agree to a title match at TakeOver, Cole and Velveteen Dream, but if Cole wins, then Dream will not be allowed to challenge the belt again while Adam is the champion. And uh, then Regal says at the end he will find a special place for them where the spotlight can truly shine on them. So it sounds like they're setting up another kind of cinematic match. Something out in the field somewhere with a lot of post-production is what I'm speculating. That's exactly how they set up the one final beat match with Organo and Ciampa uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with their takeover style match and whatnot. So uh, I'm excited about that one. I think this is like, some good back and forth here, setting up the title match and everything. Good to see Regal again on television. Tommaso Ciampa taking on Leon Ruff in a pretty short match here. We see Scarlett actually showing up and just looking on as the match goes on. And so it's Ciampa with a lot of looks to Scarlett as uh, he is wrestling here. He ends up beating Leon with the fairy tale ending and then so sends a message to uh, Karrion Cross, who then shows up as his eyes show up on the big screen and he warns Champa that at TakeOver he will make Champa feel something he's never felt in his life. I wonder what that feeling could be. In your main event, Matt Riddle takes on Timothy Thatcher in a rematch, but this time it's in what they call the fight pit. It's not the lion's den, but it's damn close. They took out the turnbuckle pads and the ropes, they put the cage around there and then there's scaffolding on the outside so they can stand up and do some stuff there and Kurt Angle is your special guest referee and by the way knockouts and tap outs are the only way to win in this matchup here. This match is great because it's right up both guys alleys. It's like the match they had a few weeks ago but the, the intensity is just turned up to 11. 
because you know Matt Riddle's got that experience in the UFC, and Thatcher with the catch wrestling experience, having fought in those blood sport matches during WrestleMania weekend and whatnot. Uh, these guys just go beat the hell out of each other. It looks really good, uh, very physical. At one point early in the match, Riddle kicks Thatcher in the face, and there's this just great visual of Thatcher just bleeding from the mouth, apparently having lost some teeth. It looked pretty kayfabe, but still a very compelling visual nonetheless. Thatcher is still able to fight as we come back from commercial. The fighting has, has a lot of back and forth here, and Beth Phoenix, sure enough, says Shades of the Lion's Den. Hey, I love that reference. Uh, Thatcher gets knocked off the scaffolding, and uh, Riddle with a huge floating bro from the scaffolding into the mat. More fighting on the ground. Thatcher catches Riddle in a rear naked choke, and Riddle passes out. Kurt does the uh, arm drops and everything. Guest referee Kurt Angle does the arm drops, and uh, that's it. Thatcher gets his win back from a couple weeks ago. Stands tall here. Like I said, I love the physicality. I loved how it played to their strengths. The concept itself is pretty cool. I like the fact that it's not, it wasn't just a standard cage match. There was like other accoutrement to go with it. And uh, the added little bonus of Kurt Angle being the guest referee, though it didn't add to the story per se, it was a nice little visual to see him back on TV in this kind of like official capacity. And uh, yeah, I, it was just a great main event. Dynamite's cold open has the inner circle outside, still kind of licking their wounds after what we saw at the stadium stampede match on Saturday. And Jericho says, you know, we have the pep rally tonight. We got a, we have to band together for that. I just hope we can recoup the cost of these shirts we ordered, these championship t-shirts that are now inaccurate because they didn't win the match. And then Santana pulls up this, uh, this truck door to reveal it's just a ton of boxes. They have way more shirts they could possibly handle. And Ortiz is just yelling because he's still deaf from the bell getting rung on Saturday. I just laughed my ass off this opening bit. Then we go to our first match. It's a six-man tag as Matt Hardy and the Bucks of Youth take on Joey Janela and Private Party. Uh, before the match, we get a little promo from the Elite and Matt backstage. Uh, Omega and Paige just split right away. Like, Paige wants to go back to the hotel room and start drinking, and Omega just wants to go with him, I guess. So then the Young Bucks ask Matt to change to another one of his characters, because he's like the Damascus character. He walks off, he comes back as, you know, velour shirt-wearing Matt Hardy, and they ask him to turn the dial back a couple more years. So he leaves, comes back again as kind of like a version of high voltage from the Omega days. So uh, really more in line with the Young Bucks aesthetic. And so the match itself was a lot of fun. Great, exciting uh, action throughout. At one point early in the match, you've got Nick Jackson accidentally super kicking the blade on the outside who's like, at ringside watching. JR in commentary makes a bit of a dig at WWE's plexiglass they have that separate the wrestlers from the audience members uh, at their shows lately. Uh, anyway, uh, Matt Hardy with a hot tag. It's a big moonsault onto all three of his opponents. There's a double plancha by the private party guys, but upon landing, Mark Quinn seems to jam his leg. It looks pretty hurt. He is unable to finish the matchup, and so you've got more bang for your buck on Isaiah Cassidy for the Bucks of Youth to win. And then right after, you see Matt Hardy going with the referee to check on Mark Quinn, and they both carry him out, which is some nice sportsmanship. Cool for Matt to do that. I really hope that Mark Quinn is okay. A lot of injuries, sadly, in AEW this past week alone. But then after Matt and the referee Mark Quinn all leave, the Butcher and the Blade show up, and they start beating up the Young Bucks. Then who rolls in on a truck? It's not Cody. It's not the Revival either. It's FTR, uh, the former Revival. You have Dash Harwood and Cash Wheeler are their names, and they come to the ring, and they kind of do a face-off there. They start beating up Butcher and the Blade. They hit the Shatter Machine onto the Butcher, and then they do a stare down with the Young Bucks, and they just kind of walk away. So finally, finally, I think this is something that was speculated on even before the very first show AEW did. The Revival, or the former Revival, now FTR, they have finally arrived in AEW, and they seem to be on a collision course with the Young Bucks, which is what fans have been wanting for what feels like 100 years now. But I'm really excited about that match happening. Cool to see them debuting here the way they did in AEW. At least we didn't see, like, the kind of Cody pull-up where it's like you see the truck and they drive, like, 10 feet, or stop and hit some trash cans. It was a bit more dramatic of a move. They learned their mistakes from what they did with the Cody fight a few weeks ago. So after after winning the casino ladder match in dramatic fashion on Saturday, Brian Cage making his Dynamite debut accompanied by Taz to take on Lee Johnson. John Moxley, by the way, is on commentary for this matchup here. And uh, it's a pretty short academic matchup here. Lee destroys, uh, Cage I should say, destroys Johnson with lots of slams and throws, hits the drill claw to win the match in very emphatic fashion. And then afterward, Taz on the microphone putting Moxley over but still saying, you know, this man is a machine, Cole. No doubt about it. He's going to 
to beat you up, fight a fest, beat him if you can, survive if he lets you, Cole. So kind of cool he kind of lent his catchphrase, his very signature catchphrase, to uh, Brian Cage for this one here. Uh, they're really hedging their bets with this one because they say Fighter Fest sometime this summer this match is going to be happening. They haven't established a date yet or location. They're clearly waiting for this whole pandemic thing to you know how it's going to shake down and if they can have an actual show with a crowd. So time will tell on that one. But whenever that match happens, should be a good one. We get a medical update from Dr. Britt Baker, DMD. She is wheeled out on a wheelchair, pushed by her assistant, Rebel, and on the back of the wheelchair says, Role Model, with two L's. Very nice touch. Very awkward beginning, though, because they toss to Tony Schiavone, who seems to not hear his cue, and then he's like, The rules of being a role model. The rules of being a role model. And like, he doesn't know what's going on. Britt hasn't talked. He hands the microphone to Britt. I don't know. And things get more awkward here because Rebel is also very awkward when she's flipping the pages on the big poster board at Britt's behest. Either they didn't rehearse this or it's intentionally meant to be this like awkward, cringy thing. But I don't think they would be so meta as to do that. But anyway, the whole gist of this is Britt talks about her injury and she saw, she says all the ladies involved in that tag team match, Chris Statlander, Hikaru Shida, and Nyla Rose were all co-conspirators. It was a plan to injure her and break her tibia, what happened last week in that tag team match. And then they bring out the conspiracy board, you know the, the kind, with like the pictures and the red string connecting all together. Aubrey Edwards, Britt alleges, is the center of this conspiracy. And she says, you know, the joke's on you because I'll be back at All Out. And then she's wheeled off. I thought Britt's delivery was okay. I thought she was funny and just saying, you know, um, oh, she, she says Chris Statlander's uh, whole thing is an alien. a crock of shit. Conspirator. Uh, she was entertaining, but the awkwardness of Tony and Rebel was like too much to bear at some point for me. But uh, yeah, now we know the update with uh, Britt Baker and she did it in her classic Britt Baker role model style. We get a promo of the Inner Circle backstage with Alex Marvez. Jericho doesn't get very far in the promo though until Orange Cassidy just kind of wanders into the shot and uh, throws everything off. Jericho seems to take offense to Orange interrupting him. Then we go to our next match as the new women's champion, Hikaru Shida, takes on Christy Janes. Pretty short match here. Janes looks impressive with some very athletic moves, but Shida ends up winning with the Falcon Arrow. So good to see Shida in action after the war she had with Nyla Rose back on Saturday. We get like a picture in picture of Paige and Omega in their hotel room, seemingly watching the show like during the commercial break. Why they thought that was a good idea, I'm not entirely sure because they're talking and you hear that you see them talking, but we never hear what they say. So anyone who got the picture in picture footage live like on Fight TV or something, please let me know what they said, because the fact they put it on commercial break for no one to hear, I thought was a weird choice. And then in our next segment, Cody comes out to speak about winning the TNT championship on Saturday. He compares himself to Tom Brady because, you know, Tom Brady was drafted so late as a rookie. And then Cody was he says he was not the first man that Tony Khan uh, picked to to lead to run AEW like okay I don't know that that, that sounds weird to, for him to say uh, Cody talk about his brother and how he's got you know how, how Dustin got all the dusty jeans and whatnot and then we cut to see the front row we see Dustin there with Brandy then we see QT Marshall who's like chatting it up with uh, Allie the former bunny like and she's not the bunny here she's not hanging out with Butcher and Blade when that happened when did Allie break up or split from the butcher and the blade and be herself again that seemed to have no explanation but anyway they're t they're they're hanging out at ringside and then finally uh cody wraps up the promo by saying you know he's going to be a fighting champion every week he will defend the tnt championship in an open challenge so uh, i thought it was a solid promo by cody the tom brady comparison was kind of weird but i like that the the championship will be defended weekly it's very much like a tv championship in that respect you love to see it kip sabian and jimmy havoc take on Cass and Scorpio Sky of SCU, where the winners will take on the tag team champions next week. Why, I have no idea, because uh, Sabian and Havoc aren't even ranked. But anyway, this match is a much slower, different pace than the six-man we saw at the beginning of the night, but still very well done. The SCU later is attempted, but Penelope Ford with a timely bit of interference. That allows for Sabian and Havoc to win with a uh, Michinoku driver dropkick combo. So they win the matchup here, and they will be facing uh, Paige and Omega next week and then they said the winner of that match will then defend the belt against the best friends at fighter fest sometime in the summer
MJF cutting a promo backstage. He says he's the biggest up and coming star in AEW and he didn't have to come from somewhere else to earn that distinction. He says even though he's undefeated, he has not gotten a championship match yet. So maybe winning this battle royal will give him that opportunity to fight Cody once again. And he says when it comes down to me and Wardlow, he'll know what to do. Wardlow speaks up. MJF gets right in his face and yells at him and goes, ah, I'm just kidding. It's a rib. We're going to have a ton of fun out there. Then we go to that battle royal now. The winner gets a shot at the TNT title sometime in the future. You've got MJF. You've got Wardlow, you got Christopher Daniels, the Jurassic Express, Cole Cabana, Brandon Cutler, Sonny Kiss, uh, Peter Avalon, Billy Gunn, who comes in from the crowd, and then Orange Cassidy shows up last, but before he can make it into the ring, Santana and Ortiz beat him down as punishment for him daring to walk across the Inner Circle's interview shot from earlier. Uh, Wardlow protecting MJF in the corner as the match goes on, people get eliminated. Orange Cassidy finally gets in the ring after a while, and so then uh, MJF goes to hit him with the diamond ring. Orange does. Ducks, MJF, Dex Wardlow instead, and they both get taken out by Orange and Jungle Boy, who are the last two guys in the ring. And after a little bit of wrestling, a uh, great Hurricane Rana spot by Jungle Boy over the top rope. So Orange gets uh, flung out of the ring. Jungle Boy wins, and they announce right away he's going to face Cody next week for the TNT Championship. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited. I, I liked the match here. It had some good moments. At one point, Cole Cabana gets eliminated, and the Dark Order hand him a flyer. So ooh, some seeds being planted there. But yeah, overall, Overall, this is an entertaining battle royal, and uh, it's cool to see Jungle Boy get that shot next week. It's finally time for the Inner Circle pep rally. We see some cheerleaders on stage dancing during the commercial break, and then finally Vicky Guerrero shows up to introduce the Inner Circle, uh, and then you've got all the guys in the ring. Jericho insists that uh, they will rise again. They start throwing the t-shirts out into the crowd. Sim and th what, what plays out next is very similar to the celebration that Jericho had uh, many months ago, the one that was uh, introduced by Virgil, or Soul Train Jones. Uh, Guevara hands out participation trophies. Santana has some goodies for his teammates, including chopped cheese. You hear Excalibur go, you're <laughs> on commentary. Jericho gives Sammy a scooter instead of a crutch. And then Ortiz, uh, he gives him some noise canceling headphones for Ortiz. I can hear again. I can hear. And then Jake Hager, the highlight of this whole segment is Jake Hager reading a, pro uh, a poem that he wrote about happiness. And then by the end, it gets way too intense. And he goes, I'm happy. And then finally, Jericho, he, he tells people what he wants. He wants Mike Tyson for what happened on an episode of Raw in January of 2010. Yeah, that's that's Jericho's motivation. Out comes Mike Tyson and his motley ass crew of uh, his posse. And then you've got the stare down here with Jericho and Tyson. Jericho wants Tyson to apologize for that knockout punch 10 years ago in another company. And so then Tyson, he, tear, he strolls to tear his shirt off, flexes in Jericho's face. Tyson shoves Jericho, Jericho shoves back, and then they all has fight. The inner circle and the posse, and then all the locker room come out and try and pull apart Brawl as we fade to black. It's January of 98 all over again. I was expecting Cody to just come and go, you ruined it, you ruined it, damn it. Like, what? Why'd you do that? Why? 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 Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, NXT or Dynamite. This week, my choice is going to be NXT. I think it was just a much more solid, complete show from start to finish. Starting out strong with that triple threat match, the Cruiserweight title tournament, ending really strong with the uh, the fight pit match with Riddle and Thatcher. It's a nice levity thrown in the middle with uh, Mia Yim and Keith Lee ragging on the Garganos and whatnot. You know, AEW with some familiar beats that I enjoyed throughout the night, but uh, the Britt Baker promo is a bit too awkward for, for my liking. And then just the whole thing with Mike, I don't know why they think that a feud with Mike Tyson and Chris Jericho in 2020 is going to move the needle. Maybe 10 years ago you could have had something, and obviously Jericho is arguably AEW's biggest star with the most, like, you know, most attention or most recognition from wrestling fans. I get that. And Mike Tyson, he's back in the headlines because he's trying to prepare for a comeback and he's back in great shape and, you know, he, he wants to have another fight or whatever. And, you know, I get why they're doing this. It's synergy. But I just, I don't know why they're trying to recreate what happened more than 20 years ago with Jarrett, with uh, with Tyson and Austin. And where, what's the payoff for this going to be? I, you know, kudos to Jericho for doing this. I think he's the only guy right now who could really kind of conceivably pull it off. Even though it makes me wonder, why is he fighting Tyson? Like, shouldn't he be trying to challenge for the AEW title again? Like, what's his, what's his motivation for that? I just, um... I don't know. This, I thought this was kind of weird. Weird way to end the show, and it's a weird direction to take. Just, I mean, yeah, you know, it worked 20 years ago. Yeah, you know, but 
I don't know if it's gonna have the same steam in 2020. But let me know what you thought about NXT and AEW in the comments section below, and be sure to give it a vote by going to the iCard in the corner of your screen. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.